Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Kidney Coach YouTube channel. I am naturopath Fiona Chin, and I am joined today by the amazing Lindsay Zerka. She joins us from the Kidney Nutrition Institute. Uh, she works alongside the beautiful Jessie Anna, who we often have on here chatting away. And Lindsay is a real, she's a registered uh, dietitian. She's been doing this since 2008, so for a long time. Um, isn't it funny that we think the early 2000s is now a long time? Like, that's crazy. <laughs> anyway, don't get me started on time and time dilation. But <laughs> but Lindsay has a real interest in all things autoimmune and um, really the autoimmune kidney diseases. So we're really looking at lupus and IgA and nephropathy as being the main ones. So Lindsay, why kidneys? And, you know, what made you get into this? Because you were telling me just before that you've been doing kidneys since you started in nutrition, which is unusual. It is. I was looking for a job when I first graduated and I, I didn't really love the idea of working at a hospital, although I appreciated the, the wide experiences I would get, but it wasn't really what I was looking for. And then I saw a job opening for a dialysis unit um, near my hometown and, and I applied and the, the, doc, the final say was from the doctor and he asked me what restaurant I like to eat at. And I said an Italian one nearby, which he apparently agreed with because then I got the job. So, <laughs> so serendipitous, so, just been in kidneys the whole time. Yeah. So it just happened upon it. And then I found the challenge really fascinating. I love the opportunity to work with patients longer term so I could, you know, see progress and really work through stuff and help them. And so I really enjoyed that and ended up staying in kidneys. So, and why autoimmune kidneys? How you, so you obviously went kidneys and then you've gone sideways even again, what led you to that part? Yeah. So, um, a few years ago, I actually got diagnosed with an autoimmune condition myself and, um, it happened while I was actually in grad school. Um, and so I was doing a functional nutrition kind of track and, um, learned about autoimmune and it was timely since I could try and figure it out for myself. And, you know, as we know, autoimmune is really complex and, um, a lot of the common approaches don't address a lot of the different issues that people with autoimmune deal with. And so, um, there's a lot of connection with the kidneys and gut and autoimmune. And so it was natural for me to kind of apply some of the expertise, um, in the kidney world as well. Amazing. So do you want to share your autoimmune disease? Because I really wanted oh, to link up, yes. you know, what you were saying with autoimmune and, and the relation to the condition. Yes, I was diagnosed with an autoimmune thyroid condition, which actually seems to run in my family. I have multiple family members with autoimmune thyroid. And <clears throat> You know, it's interesting because Dr. Camp and I had this conversation yesterday that we, one of the things he does with people with kidney disease is he's testing for thyroid disease and there seems to be a link. And you and I were just saying the same thing before that people often don't know that potentially a thyroid disease may precede kidneys or especially in autoimmune kidney disease. I know in MS, I'm always checking for thyroid autoantibodies because there seems to be this link. So do you want to tell our listeners a little bit more about the link between the thyroid and the kidneys and why sometimes that's you know, there's a link that way? I think there could be a couple of links based on my current understanding is that, um, that it is a fairly well-known connection that people who have a higher TSH have an increased risk for kidney disease and their kid kidney disease progresses more quickly. And the current thought process mainly with that is that because the thyroid is so highly involved in that nitric oxide production and mm -hmm. helping with endothelial function and oxygenation of tissues, that when that TSH is high, that um, the, the kidneys really essentially aren't getting oxygenated very well. So it's kind of a slow um, chronic oxygen deprived state. And so that can cause kidney damage over time. And that's one of the big reasons why um, looking at thyroid can really help you find any missing pieces in therapy. Um, if you can address that, I had a recent client actually who, um, he had thyroid cancer and they switched his medication and his, his TSH went really high and obviously he felt terrible, but his kidney function also tanked. Um, but he just messaged me actually today saying that his TSH was back in a normal range and they had seen an improvement in his GFR already. So Amazing. I'm happy to see that. Okay. So it's really the 
thyroid comes first because the change in thyroid function and the change to the epithelial cells and the nitric oxide is what will then show a decline in kidney function. It could potentially, depending on what is you know, going on with the thyroid, I think another connection with the thyroid and kidney disease could actually be with the gut. Because yeah. if you have an autoimmune problem, you have a, a gut problem right because they're just going to be connected it's not that fixing the gut is like the end-all thing but it's not something you can ignore and we know that the gut plays a significant role with kidney as well and so if someone has an autoimmune thyroid condition um, it could long term um, be impacting the kidneys if um, things aren't well managed I think and so you can look at the gut and the thyroid to help support the kidney as well as the autoimmune yeah okay so that's really, fa- I find that really fascinating because a lot of people that is a missing link or they're not looking at that or they're trying to fix the kidneys and maybe the thyroid's been missed, especially, you know, when we're seeing diabetes and cardiovascular disease, we might see that change in blood pressure or, you know, obesity and things like that, that and the fatigue and the things that go with thyroid disease, but it may not be tested or the TSH can be normal, but we can often have, I often see in MS, we have a normal TSH with thyroid antibodies and no one in Australia that is a specialized test no one's doing that as a standard test unless you've got a really good doctor asking for it so often thyroid disease is going completely undiagnosed especially if you've got other symptoms going with it that we know fatigue's part of kidney disease and so it's again just been missed and like you pointed out that can be a really big missing piece that if you can get the thyroid back in which will then change the nitric oxide and improve blood flow and epithelial function then that may be a big piece for some people with um, kidney disease huh absolutely and I think the other thing I actually just thought of too is how with a lot of hormones toxins can sit in those receptor sites and Mm. so like you could have like a well functioning thyroid but maybe um, there's some genetic SNPs or, you know, some other, you know, things going on and his kidney function kind of declines and those toxins build up. Those toxins could potentially be displacing that thyroid hormone or other hormones, and that could cause further issues. So there's, it's kind of a mixing bowl of things and really helpful to take a look and see what tornado of things may be occurring. So you can kind of pull it out and address it. Yeah, fascinating. So when we're looking at autoimmune diseases, you work, is it mostly lupus and IgA nephropathy that you're working with? Primarily, we actually haven't had a significant amount of people with lupus come through. Um, it is primarily IgA nephropathy and also people who have thyroid conditions that have maybe other um, contributing causes to kidney disease as well. Fascinating. Okay. So what is it, you know, generally we, you know, if I'm talking to Jesse Anna, we're saying we're alkalizing, we're keeping you slightly ketogenic, unless we're doing keto analogs or in stage or something like that. What is it about a autoimmune condition and how would you address the diet differently versus a standard kidney disease that doesn't have any autoimmune relationship to it? One of the big things is looking at um, what big symptoms they are dealing with. Um, A lot of times um, because of autoimmune conditions, there's common symptoms of um, maybe food sensitivities, digestive issues, um, hormone imbalances, um, and because of um, an unhealthy gut, micronutrient deficiencies, vitamin and mineral deficiencies. So sometimes to try and prioritize, I, I try and look and see what symptoms they're dealing with. And a lot mm-hmm. of times it ends up looking at addressing um, how we can make their day-to-day quality of life better. And that usually is primarily by looking at if they have known food sensitivities, like how we can make them have a more well-rounded nutrient dense diet um, so that they can get all the nutrients their body needs so they can feel well and nourished and overcome that fatigue and also support healing. Um, And then, you know, excluding those foods that may be causing issues. There are different tests that can be done to give people uh, a better idea of that. So that's a lot of times one of the first things we do is we try and remove what other kind of things may be Um, causing symptoms but also simultaneously causing their immune system to be really imbalanced 
And do you find most patients that come in know that they've got food sensitivities or is it when you see an autoimmune, the first thing that you're like, right, we need to test for food sensitivities. I mean, it's one of two things, right? So if I'm seeing an MS patient, I take them all off gluten and dairy because we just know that, you know, the, the molecular mimicry that goes on with myelin and, yeah. and those things and then if they don't improve because the tests can be quite expensive I always run a food sensitivity test is that something you do or is it you go right you've got a thyroid disease or lupus or IgA nephropathy the immune system is overreacting to something like you say normally coming out of the gut I'm going to just run a food sensitivity test because some people don't even know they've got food sensitivities right so how did is that something you would just test for or do you do an elimination diet to try and figure it out first I, I personally prefer to do testing like for my, because I know for myself, I did food sensitivity testing. And even though it was hard, it was really nice for me to know, okay, like I know, and even some of the testings, they do have some false positives. So a lot of people don't like them because they're like, oh, it's overly restricting. But I, <coughs> within, for myself, within two days, I felt so much better oh, within wow. two days of pulling my foods out. And so I feel like for a lot of people, it is a sacrifice to pull out foods. And so if you have some kind of concrete evidence to say, like, we don't have to guess. And because we know with a lot of food sensitivities that it can be up to two days before you have some kind of reaction, mm -hmm. or there could be other things that you're sensitive to like air pollution or different types of chemicals or toxins. And it sometimes has to be the perfect storm for you to actually see a reaction, even though there is some kind of immune inflammatory reaction taking place. So that is the ideal, I feel like, to do some kind of testing. However, I do recognize budgets are a thing and sometimes that money needs to go somewhere else. And so I do sometimes pull out, if they already know they're sensitive to certain foods and gluten and dairy um, are really big ones that a lot of times people really do see benefits with um, when they pull those out, so... Yeah. Do you have any other foods on the hit list that you seem, you know, like, like say in MS, it's gluten, dairy, and then you generally see eggs comes up quite a bit, but maybe not so much in other conditions. And then um, they'd be the big ones. And then it, then it really goes down to a patient individual. I had one patient allergic to lettuce. We could not figure out what was causing it. And it was the lettuce thing. We took lettuce out and she got better. And I, I was like, I've never seen an allergy to lettuce in my life. <laughs> is there anything that you've seen that you go yeah that's really standard when it comes to thyroid and kidneys or again is it just this gluten dairy and then it's just a mismatch of whatever you know sometimes corn and soy I think can be big players in that area but um, I also really just feel like processed food in general because there's so many different things in there that one are inflammatory um, and so a lot of times if it's easier it's like let's just try and, and shift you to a whole foods diet and see if you feel better. So there's yeah. kind of varying levels depending on where somebody is at, um, what, you know, we can work with. And are there certain labs or, I mean, I know you're in the U S so we're a bit different here, but I often send a lot of my patients across their bloods across to the U S are there certain tests that you prefer? I'm just thinking people are going to ask, you know, what labs they <laughs> should get food sensitivity from is that is that something you've got a preferred lab that you use for that sort of stuff I um, really like to use the mediator um, response test uh, MRT um, mm -hmm. because it is a little bit different than other food sensitivity testing where a lot of the food sensitivity testing will test for a specific type of antibody response like um, an IgE antibody response is kind of like the anaphylactic, like everybody knows when they got that because they've carried enough UPEN with them. But IgG antibody response, which is a really common food sensitivity test, um, it can uh, have um, antibodies uh, produced to it that you're not necessarily having a current inflammatory immune reaction to. Um, that is the testing that I did and I did still see benefits. So sometimes I feel like something is better than nothing, but the MRT is a little bit different because it will, um, expose the, um, your white blood cells to all these different types of foods and it will measure the, um, inflammatory response. So any type of inflammatory response is, in, is captured in the test result. So I feel like it's fairly accurate and, 
Um, we've seen really helpful results, especially we have people come in and they take symptom survey uh, for us. And, you know, we kind of tally up the points. And I had um, a couple of clients just this past summer who did it. And when they initially did it, their symptom scores were like 80 and 95 and just like had a lot of really bad symptoms they were dealing with on a daily basis. And two weeks into it, their symptom score was cut by half, at least. That was taking just those foods out, huh? And all we did was take those foods out. And so it's just amazing when you can identify what foods your body is reacting to, you can pull them out. And then the really awesome thing about it is that you do not have to avoid those foods for the rest of your life for the most part. There may be yeah. some times that there's some foods that your body's like, I'm just really never going to appreciate that. But if you work on reducing the inflammation and healing the gut, then your immune system is not going to be interacting with those foods in the same way once you get things rebalanced. And you can usually add in back those foods safely. And I feel like that's like always hope at the end. You're just like, okay, this is it forever. I can do it. Yeah, no, that's a really good point, actually. So I just want to circle back because people will be like, oh, hang on, maybe I've had a food sensitivity test. And you're right, same in Australia. We Doctors are testing the IgE, which is your anaphylactic. Then we have the IgG, which is the up to 48 hours. We also run IgAs. And then the ones that I use in the US, which isn't the um, MRT one, we run something, I think it runs through a CD3, CD4. Mm -hmm. um, it at that. But I really like the one that you're saying. So you're basically exposing the food to the white blood cells and then any, so they're just looking at any cytokine release, anything that that immune system cell does. So if the, if the white blood cell goes danger, I'm making an antibody that'll get flagged on the test. Yeah. And the test results, they, they kind of show it in a, a green, yellow, red kind of format, but they also put number values next to them. So you can really see like maybe this food is green, but I eat it all the time and it's kind of on the high end. So maybe that's, you know, it gives you a ton of flexibility to really pinpoint where, you know, things are happening. So it's really nice. Amazing. Okay. Well, that sounds really good. So there you go, people. If you've got a, if you've had food sensitivity before and it's not been this and you still think you're getting some symptoms, it might be worth just revisiting that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's say you've got a patient come in and you're working with thyroid and kidney disease, you've run the food sensitivity test. How is a autoimmune diet different from a standard kidney disease diet? What Take me through a typical sort of, we've got the process, we've maybe taken out certain foods, but what are people generally eating in a day? And then we'll obviously make room for people's food sensitivities on top of that. Yes, <laughs> So a lot of times the, the protein piece is kind of tricky um, because we are really actively working on making sure we heal the gut and you have to have protein to help heal. And so depending on where someone's kidney function is at, we may use keto analogs to help provide um, protein that's not quite as burdensome to the kidneys, but still provides for the body's needs. So but we are definitely also um, considering that, uh, or our experience has just been our autoimmune patients do not always feel super great on a 100% plant-based diet. And that is mm. a difference for a lot of our other um, kidney clientele is that a lot of them will feel fairly well um, or amazing on a completely plant-based diet. But for autoimmune, for some reason, they seem to need a, at least a small amount of animal protein to really um, help them feel well. And I'm not sure if it's because um, they get a little bit better mineral balance or different types of um, beneficial fats, or um, there could be a lot of reasons for that, but that has just kind of been our experience. So that is a difference is that we will tend to include some more animal protein in there. Mm -hmm. And then um, we will also be a lot more conscientious about toxins or chemicals coming in through the food. Obviously, those things aren't good for anybody, but when we're really trying to calm down the immune system, we're going to be looking at, can we choose organic um, as we're increasing fruits and vegetables? Or if organic doesn't work out budget-wise, there's um, you can use like... Uh, 
vinegar to soak the veggies in and fruits to try and to get off a lot of the pesticides and um, looking at the food packaging and trying to be really conscientious of how they can eliminate a lot of those toxins and chemicals because those are also going to be setting off the immune response. And so we're trying to just get those things out of people's systems. No, that's a really good point. I, again, I found in practice too, I did when I was first diagnosed with MS, I did plant-based and felt awful. And then yeah. as soon as I put animal protein back in, I felt a thousand times better. And it's definitely, it's definitely my experience too. So walk us through a general, you know, say I've come in to see you, Lindsay, and we've done some food sensitivity tests. So I just, I'll leave them out because yeah. they're obviously an individual thing, but walk me through a typical menu plan for someone with a autoimmune kidney kind of diet what are you sort of suggesting from breakfast snacks all the way through to dinner what would a sort of meal plan look like for one of a better yeah so um a breakfast could look like anything from a smoothie I really love smoothies for breakfast or snacks because it's really easy to make them different um but you can also pack them with different kinds of nutrients so um you uh, just would put in, you know, some type of healthy fat, um, whether it's like coconut milk, or you put in some nut butter, or you put in an avocado, and then whatever kind of fruits and vegetables you love. And um, depending some people uh, where their kidney function is at, they'll add some kind of protein. So it could be like a really clean protein powder, or, Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, the nut butter adds that. So some kind of smoothie um, is a really great option for breakfast. And then um, for lunch could easily, um, a lot of the, for a lot of our meal planning, we teach them how to make like one type of breakfast and make it versatile. So a lot of times we do smoothies for lunch and then, or breakfast. And then for lunch, we do salads and we teach people how to make a full satisfying salad. That's one of the challenges of, eating more plants and people are like eating their like well usually I eat like a cup of salad and then they eat their cup of salad for lunch and we're like diet is terrible I'm so (laughs) hungry and it's not even satisfying we're like no when you're eating more plants like lettuce doesn't have a lot to it and greens don't have a lot to it when you only eat a cup so you gotta (laughs) you know really build that up and we show them how to add like um you know non- starchy vegetables and even some starchy vegetables kind of help with that feeling of fullness um you know some different types of protein whether it's beans or nuts or a little bit of animal protein and then adding different textures to it um and different like uh like bursts of flavor like whether you add like a little bit of citrus or things like that so we kind of teach them how to to craft that. And if they want to add like a soup or something like that, soup and salad, I feel like those are really common things our clients are already doing. So we just kind of shift it a little bit Mm -hmm. so that it's relatable. And then for dinner, we teach um, them how to make a a well-balanced stir fry. So you can use rice or cauliflower rice or zucchini noodles. Like you can use a wide variety of things for the base. And then again, mix in whatever veggies um, a small amount of protein, depending on where your needs are at. And again, lots of different beneficial fats, uh, for sauces and stuff like that, that you can add in. And again, it's really easy to make different flavors of stir fries and really easy to use up vegetables. So they don't go bad or use like a frozen mix that's already washed and pre-chopped. So it doesn't have to take forever. You don't have to be gourmet. So we do stuff like that. And then for snacks, Um, People a lot of times can do really similar things. We always talk about two food group snacks. Um, Historically, people will be hungry. So they grab like a granola bar or a handful of nuts. And then five seconds later, they're starving, right? Because with the granola bar, all you gave yourself was carbs. You didn't give yourself any like fiber or protein or fat. Um, And with the nuts, you got a little bit of that, but you didn't give yourself, again, enough staying power for it to really keep you full. So It might be like an apple with some nut butter because you're getting, you know, some carbohydrates, some fiber, a little bit of protein, a little bit of fat. So it's really well balanced. So that usually helps people feel so much better um, for a snack. So that's kind of a typical meal. Um, 
planning option that people can do and still give themselves a, quite a bit of variety. Great. And beverages, what are you sort of suggesting people are drinking in a day? Again, is it different? So, what you doing or? Typically not super different. Um, kind of the general stuff applies that applies to like general healthy, like a lot of juice and sugary drinks, like those kind of things, they're not going to be as ideal because uh, they don't have very many nutrients in them. And um, a lot of times they have other additives and things like that. And high amounts of sugar can really feed inflammation. And it's, it's really easy in a drink to get a lot of sugar. Mm -hmm. So, but you know, yeah, different types of herbal teas, uh, flavored waters, as long as they don't have a bunch of additives or artificial ingredients. Um, in them work really well for people who like to have some flavor. There's a product here that we really like um, called True Lemon. It's like a powdered like lemonade mix and it has one gram of sugar in it and it uses stevia, which some people don't like, some people do, but they have a lot of different flavors. So it's really easy to give yourself a flavored drink that's super quick and doesn't have a bunch of added fake things in it. Amazing. So, okay, so we've walked people through and I hopefully people have got a really good understanding of how kidney disease and thyroid goes together. Are you suggesting, you know, and I'm thinking with you talking, like if you have anyone coming with kidney disease testing, I mean, it's standard for me with people with MS, it's making sure that people are testing for thyroid antibodies. Is that an easy thing to do in the States? It's, it can be quite tricky in Australia to get a GP to run it because it's not necessarily bulk build through our Medicare system unless it's proof of that so you know you have to argue to go well you've got an autoimmune disease we should really be running that is that the same sort of thing that you face in the states? yeah okay. yeah most of the time if people are like oh I, th I think you know I have a thyroid thing most of the time the only test that gets run is a TSH I, it's, it's just here. like you know that comes from a different <laughs> gland altogether <laughs> like <laughs> yeah it's so, coming from the but you're, uh, but you're, yeah yeah it's not coming yeah. from the, it's not going to tell us much <laughs> so we have a lot of opportunities to help people feel empowered to have really confident conversations with their doctors because right. we talk with them and say okay these are the type of tests that i think would be really helpful and so like if they already have a thyroid condition and they like we're suspecting other things going on sometimes like, I think, okay, is it going to be worth the extra money? Is it going to change the therapy? And a lot of times for some people, they're just like, I need to know what is going on in my body. Like maybe mm -hmm. we're going to do the same thing anyway, but it's so helpful and vindicating for people to know, like there was something like else her. weird going on with me. Right. So, um, yeah. So if I feel like, like if they're already on like a thyroid medication, but I'm noticing all these other kind of things happening, then I will say, you know what, let's just take a deeper look in your thyroid. So I'll recommend the TSH, T3, T4, reverse T3, and then the thyroid antibodies as well. Um, and sometimes people have doctors that are super supportive and they're just like, of course, like, yeah, let's totally do that. And sometimes their doctors just like, it, they're not really involved. So mm -hmm. there are um, online, they have different websites like request a test that um, two major labs in the US um, that you can go in and you can just order them yourself. Yeah, we've got your, I think your labs and it's really not, it's actually not, I was surprised it's really not that expensive. People can go in and order their own tests, which I was impressed about. We don't have that so much here. It always has to go through a uh, naturopath or another healthcare provider. But yeah, I was impressed in the States, you can just order your own blood work, which is really useful. Yeah. I mean, it's obviously more ideal to have all your providers on board because managing different multiple chronic diseases is a challenge, but yeah. if not everyone's on board and you need information, then it's really nice to have that option. I think. Oh, I agree. I think it's all about information at the end of the day. That's how we can make our treatment strategies and really nail down. And I think, you know, for me, I find most patients, they've got an intuition, but most of them just want to know. And it's about that being empowered or you know, having more information to go back to specialists saying, well, actually, <laughs> we've had the test and I wasn't crazy. <laughs> These results actually really solidify how I was feeling. So mm -hmm. I think that's nice to, you know, like you were saying, to really empower your patients to have really good conversations with their doctors. I think that's really important to be able to advocate for yourself and know how to do that because 
often that's been taken away from patients or patients don't even realize they've got the ability to advocate for themselves so that you know that's a big part of what we're here about in kidney coaching why we do so many of these videos is to really educate people so they have that ability to do that because I, I think it's important it's your body right so I agree I mean and that's something that like I kind of learned the hard way myself like when I first got diagnosed I expected like my doctors to you know know what's going on and do their job and I've had some really really great doctors but ultimately in the end nobody is going to take care of me like I can take care of me like you know you have to be the captain of your care plan ship um, because you know the the doctors are only as good for as the information you give them or the types of questions they can ask and you know you're the one who knows how you're feeling and it's really important you know for both people to work as a team but ultimately you know you have to be the one who's like, hey, this is going on. Let's do something about it. Totally agree. Dr. Camp and I had the same conversation yesterday and I, I couldn't agree more. It's that, yeah, it's that being empowered. And like you say, you're the one that's changing the diet. You're the one that's got to take any supplements. You know, mm-hmm. you, you're the one that has to meditate, adjust, to, you know, change your stress levels, all of that sort of stuff. So are there any other big top tips that you have for people with autoimmune kidney related diseases? We talked about diet, obviously. Do you want to talk about stress management and those sort of things that we know are really important that go along with it? There's so many ways that (laughs) stress management I feel is so beneficial for people who have kidney disease. And one of the big pieces that I think that we've talked about before is really supporting that vagus nerve because Mm. it's, you know, when I, I usually will show my clients a picture of how the vagus nerve, you know, obviously it starts in the brainstem, but then it's got little branches everywhere. It's really impacting your whole body. But when we're talking specifically about autoimmune and kidneys, like there's a lot of impact in your gut with the vagus nerve and with the kidneys. And so um, if people are in a, a state of chronic stress or they have had previous trauma um, and, or you know, even acute stressors that occur, that can cause that vagus nerve to lose its tone and be less active. And so you have to do things that can support that vagus nerve tone to help it um, better regulate and communicate with your brain about what's going on in your gut, what's going on with your kidneys. And I think that's, again, why stress has such a big role is because it really kind of deactivates that vagus nerve. And then your body just thinks it's trying to survive all the time. And when something is in survival mode, it's not going to take time to heal and repair or relax or anything. And I love that there is this increased awareness of recognizing that the nervous system needs support too, and that we can change our diet and we can exercise and we can take our medications and supplements. But if we don't tell our brain that we're safe and that it's okay, then we're going to be way less successful. So I think, um, taking that time, I mean, there's been lots of things that, um, research has shown can help activate the vagus nerve. There's different pressure points. So, um, different people who are trained in neural manipulation can help activate that for you. That's what I did. I went to my physical therapist and had him work on my vagus nerve. It was amazing. Yeah. My headaches like totally went away. Wow. Um, but I hum, that's how I activate mine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's things that, and that's another thing that I love about activating the vagus nerve is it's simple things that you can do every day. And that are usually going to be things that make you feel happy. So mm-hmm. like singing or humming, um, uh, what's some of the other ones? Um, Medi- yeah, just basic meditation and the breathing. The, yeah, the, the meditation and breathing. Four, four, two. Is it four, two, eight, or four, four, eight, or four, seven, eight, or box breathing, basically? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the deep breathing for sure. But honestly, I really feel like anything that makes you feel nurtured and safe mm-hmm. and self cared for. I think all of those things will help activate the vagus nerve because, like everyone yeah. says, oh, like you know, taking a cold shower, that'll activate the vagus nerve. I'm like, I'm sorry. That sounds like a terrible idea. I, because of my (laughs) thyroid condition, when I get cold, it is really hard to warm back up. I do not like being cold. So that is not going to help activate my vagus nerve. 
but yeah. other people they feel like it's super refreshing so I think when you're looking to try and, and do some stress management or vagus nerve support make sure that the thing that you choose is something that you do enjoy like if you hate singing you probably shouldn't try and sing to activate your vagus nerve right yeah that's probably just going to activate your fight or flight response <laughs> like that's yeah really exactly good. that's yeah. a really good tip Amazing. Is there anything else you want to say before we wrap up? I think there's been some really great information in here for people. And I think like most people, most people don't know there's a connection between the thyroid and, and the kidneys. And so I really appreciate you pointing that out and that massive connection. And then, you know, how the diet might be a bit different and all those sort of things. Is there anything else you feel like is really important for people to know if they're dealing with autoimmune type kidney diseases to help them feel really empowered when they're speaking to the specialists and nephrologists and doctors? I think like the two best things that I can say is one, trust your gut. Even if you have leaky gut, yeah. <laughs> um, that you can really, um, you have the opportunity to be really in tune with your body. And if you have a provider, even a really awesome provider, that's like, Hey, I think this is the direction we should go. And you're just like, I'm so not feeling that. Then you would definitely need to be empowered to say, Hey, I'm feeling like instead this or that, or, Hey, is there another option? Because financially that's not going to work for me or lifestyle wise or whatever. So I think it's really important to have good communication with your provider. Mm -hmm. And honestly, if your provider is not really like, if they're just kind of checking the boxes with you, it is okay to find somebody else who's going to take that interest. Yeah. Like it is okay to fire people from your team that aren't supporting you. And that's something that I have had to do multiple times until I found, you know, a good fit. Um, and the other thing I would say is that there's so much advice and information about what to do for autoimmune that can feel so overwhelming. And a lot of times, like you're already tired, you're already really stressed out. You already really don't feel good and thinking if I'm going to feel good again, I have to do like this whole huge list of things. And that is not helpful. And so I think the best advice I would say is to, you know, you read and you educate yourself, but then choose the one thing that resonates with you that you think this is what I can do now and just start with the one thing. And then once you've integrated that into your life and hopefully you're feeling better, you can choose the next thing to do and don't overwhelm yourself and think I have to do all this stuff perfectly. Otherwise I'm not committed to my health or I'm never going to be healed you have to just take it one step at a time. It's really good advice, Lindsay. Thank you. Thank you again for joining me. I really appreciate your expertise and time. And I think, you know, when you've gone through something yourself, you have a totally different appreciation and view of it. So thank you for being, you know, open and sharing that with our listeners. You know, I think I think that means, you know, people resonate because they're just like, oh, okay, well, she looks really well and she's doing okay. So it can't be too bad. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, you're, you're doing it, right? So, yep. yeah, thank you. Thanks again. So if you want to know more information or if, you want, if you've got an um, autoimmune disease and you want some support from a nutritionist, you can find Lindsay and I'll put the web address below, uh, below, but she's at the Kidney Nutrition Institute. And if you go on to staff, her profile's there. Um, and you do online appointments too, don't you, Lindsay? Yep. We do online appointments, one-on-one um, -on -one through Zoom or whatever Perfect. we can do phone. Mm -hmm. Great. So you can always connect with Lindsay there. Um, and don't forget to hit subscribe if you want more information or to be notified every time we put up a new podcast, make sure you hit the subscribe button. If you want to know more about what we do, head to www.kidneycoach.com. Thanks again for being part of our community. We hope you found this super useful and we will see you next time. Bye.